I was a little kid, I would just, I would just be constantly just drawing. I mean, badly because I was four or three. I, who the hell knows? My I just remember my my. It was always paper and pens and crayons and pencils just available. So I was always doing it in whatever form. And um, I grew up reading newspaper dailies, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, The Far Side, Garfield, all that stuff. So I just tried to, I tried to emulate that and I just never ever stopped. You know, 34 years later, I'm still like doodling in the margins of anything I can find. Discovering anime and manga really, really got me into uh, drawing uh, better than I than I used to um, because it was so different for me. In the 90s, everything was, all the comics were so extreme. But then there was anime where all the heroes were a lot more feminine. You know, the the, the big expressive eyes were were a huge were a huge draw for me. Didn't realizing that you know it was those old newspaper dailies that they were so similar to. There was one comic in particular, uh, it was a Gold Digger by Fred Perry. Antarctic Press put, probably still puts it out. Um, it was an American manga style. That was what it was touted as back then. Uh, and it was originally in black and white. So I could see like all of his pencil, all of his pen lines, all of his strokes, like everything. I, you know, it was just there on the page to see. I just ate those up. I tried to copy it as much as I could. And then like eventually I would, it, it sort of like turned into its own thing for me. I don't think the style changed so much. And that's what some people used to like, liked to criticize me about. Like your style hadn't changed in 11 years, you fucking hack, fuck you. No, I didn't really change the style because I liked the style. I liked the way the characters looked. On a subconscious level, I learned a lot from Bill Watterson in terms of like telling different kinds of stories on a day-to-day -day basis, how to keep a story going with a cliffhanger or a gag or a laugh or something sweet. For some reason, I'm a rock star at Kineticon and it's only there. Like, guys who I see on the convention circuit think that the reaction I get at Kineticon must be the reaction I get everywhere. Like, it's Mookie! And that's the only thing they have to say. Not what I do, not my real name, they just say Mookie, and everyone at Kineticon knows who I am. I met my friend Fembones, stage name, uh, because at the second ever Kineticon, she came to visit me because she was a reader of Dominic Deegan. She um, joined up with a Boston burlesque troupe that she didn't have a very good experience with, so I'm not gonna name names. Um, but the experience inspired her to make her own troupe. They got to doing more shows, they started to get more, uh, more notice, and eventually she asked me to be the narrator for Revenge of the Robot Battle Nuns. And then I was asked to host a couple more of her shows and I narrated Revenge of the Robot Battle Nuns when it came back to Oberon just this past year. And it's it got to the point where uh, Fembones asked me come 2014 to host every one of her shows. So I'm going to be an official member of the Slaughterhouse Sweethearts. First thing I hosted at Kineticon was the chess with the cosplay chess match. So one year I just pitched it to to Matt Daigle, who who runs Kineticon. He's a good friend of mine, and I said, "Dude, I, I, let's change the let's change the chess match up this year. Let's just do let's just bring them all up two by two, all the cosplayers, and I'll host it. Like I'll put my hand over one and my hand over the other. The crowd will decide who wins, and then they fight." There was one young lady I was sitting I was standing next to. Her costume was incredible very, very accurate, and the crowd loved her. When I put my hand over her head for the crowd to cheer, they screamed for her. They absolutely just shouted. I remember her looking out over the crowd and looking over at me, she just went, and that really is what inspired me to do the death match. Seeing somebody's thrill to meeting someone that they admire, and the fact that I'm so lucky that that someone is me, still blows my mind. The comic came about, um, out of college, I was trying to write the next great American fantasy novel. Uh, and it was terrible. It was absolutely sucked. Everybody I showed it to 
Uh, and I'm talking family and friends, not publishers or agents. Like everybody, all my friends and family I showed it to, they couldn't get through it. The name Dominic Deegan is a combination of my grandfather's name, whose name was Dominic, and growing up on in New York and just having the Major Deegan Expressway, that name somewhere in my subconscious. And the character Dominic Deegan, I made him up in the sixth grade when I was playing Dungeons and Dragons for the first time with my best friend in the world. Fast forward years, years later, I'm out of college and my friends are starting up a new Dungeons and Dragons game. I said, hey dude, you wanna, you wanna play with us? I said, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, what character should I play? And for some reason I remembered Dominic the Diviner. I was like, I should play a Diviner. That's weird. I'll do it, yeah. I need a better, I need a name. Dominic the uh, Deegan. Okay, yeah, that's cool. I fell in love with playing the character. I fell in love with the idea to the point where I started doodling comic strips about him to show off to my friends. They got so sick of me, they kicked me out of the game. And rightfully so. I was getting a little annoying. Uh, but I, I, but I, so I had all these, <clears throat> these I have these, these strips and this character I wasn't done with yet. It's like, there's, I still want to do more, but I can't because I'm, I can't, fuck. Uh, Okay, web comics. Back then, I was uh, surfing around Keen Spot and Keen Space, uh, and just seeing that they give they were giving away web comic space. I had doodled up a bunch of comics of Dominic, and I just had them lying around because I just liked the character that I'd come up with, and it's like, you know what? I'll just put those online. No one will probably see them, but whatever. And once they were online, I liked seeing them online. I liked having my own little corner of the internet. I liked the fact that Dominic's adventures were out there. The first webcomic that I ever read was Sluggy Freelance uh, by Pete Abrams. And Sluggy Freelance did the, uh, or, and probably still does, the, uh, the, the newspaper daily strip format. And other early webcomics that I had read, like, like Sinfest and Ozzy and Millie, they also did like the, the panels across uh, format. So that's just the one, uh, after growing up with that, and seeing that as web comics, my examples, I was like, I can do that too. People kind of had to know who you were. Uh, online advertising was not nearly as easy as it is today with Project Wonderful and other ad networks that are very accessible. Um, I tried to spread it with word of mouth. Word of mouth was my best friend for, a, for throughout the run of Dominic Deegan. Um, what really got people noticing me was a guest strip I did for 8-Bit Theater. Uh, Brian Clevenger's uh, old Sprite webcomic, and I had drawn a, a guest pa a guest strip for him, and I made sure to put the URL of this of the site at the bottom, like by Mookie, come see his work at blah 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 blah. After that, Mac Hall gave me a link after meeting me at the f first Kineticon. Actually, they were guests there too, and I just happened to be I just happened to be to fall in with them on, on, a, on, a, on a, a panel they were doing or just hung out with them one night. And they just, I think Matt Boyd then, I think took notice of like, this guy seemed nice. I wonder what he does. And I, I think I must've given him a card because one day I just noticed like, you're getting a lot of hits from Mac Hall. I'm like, but really? And I look over to the site and Matt Boyd has written up something very, very nice about me. And like, check it out, beware of the puns. Oh, the puns. I was proud of those. Super, super proud of those puns. Because the, 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 the worse they got, the, the more my friends would beat me up. And that's how I knew I was onto something. And even Matt Boyd, when he linked me that first time, was like, beware the puns. I just enjoy them. They're my, my favorite kind of jokes. First, there was the Keen Spot book called Crystal Clear. Um, and then I, re I started to release my own book. So everything that was in Crystal Clear, I included in uh, Sears Digest. And there was Ecstasy and Evil. And then there was The Storm of Souls. And there was the Battle for Barthus, then the War in Hell, then Two Thief or Not to Thief, and finally, the last ones that went into individual print, uh, Super Greg vs. Snow Song. It was the urge to do something different. Like, with Dominic, let's make the seer the hero. With Luna, let's make, let's make a, a character who has not a sexy deformity, but tusks. Can that work? I think it did. With Gregory, let's make the healer crippled. I was always trying to write uh, and tell 
stories for these characters that I wanted to see. And I guess just lucked out that there were other people out there who wanted to see this aspect of fantasy characters. The comic and the characters were always changing. I mean, uh, it, was a, it was a conscious decision of mine that it, no character was going to be the same at the end of any given story that they were at the beginning. The most controversial story I wrote was The War in Hell. That was the biggest one. And probably the point where people who don't like the comic really started to dislike me as a person. Uh, it was the darkest story I wrote. Uh, there's a lot of things I, I tried in that story that I never tried again. I learned my lesson. Um, killing Siegfried was... Well, got a lot of people mad at me. And uh, Melna's, uh, Melna's past, where she, where, where she was raped by Stonewater, that was very, very... To this day, I still get grief about that. Because I had said in the Battle for Barthus, traditional orc culture is very cruel to its women. And it's the cruelest thing, that's the cruelest thing I could think of. And a writing teacher once told me, you know, or any, most a lot of teachers tell me, you know, when you're telling a story, show, don't tell. You know, if you have a concept or this idea about a character, show, don't tell. I think it was just people like the idea of, like, the burly black knight, who's a good guy after all. And I chose not to do that. And People passionately disagreed. Other people were like, "No, I didn't like him from the from the start. He's much better as a as a as a hell demon warrior," which I think is pretty awesome. Myself, plus I had more fun doing like doing Siegfried as like the haunting hell knight. It was fun. I was having more fun with the character. So as much as people were passionate against that, I was happier. So like I have to, you know, I feel like any artist has to make themselves happy first if they're do if they're doing their own work. I'm not angry at people who are passionate about it uh, and who are passionately against that that choice. But uh, I get a little miffed when they project those horrible feelings onto me as a person and have in the past. Um, but people are gonna think what they're gonna think, and you can waste time trying to change their minds, or you can just move on. So Celesto kind of just kind of straddled the line between like villain and antagonist. Uh, so he was, he was, and I related to him. Um, with Celesto, I tried to give him heroic goals, but terribly villainous methods. You know, where Dominic would see something broken, he would try to fix it. When Celesto would see something broken, he would try to amputate it for the good of the rest of everything else. We're like, no, it's just a sprained it's just a sprained wrist. You're fine. Like, nope, the whole hand has to go. Just, just, no. That was Celesto's problem. He wouldn't want to fix anything. He wanted to cleanse it and redo it. Other villains, uh, the king, uh, it was my best friend in the world. David, King David, uh, is my best friend David. Um, and he had been asking me for years to put him in the comic. And I said, Dave, I got it. I'm gonna make he was upset at first to be the villain, a villain. I'm gonna make you a bad guy. He's like, don't make me a bad guy. I'm not a bad guy. He's like, no, David, Dave, I'm making you the end boss. He's like, okay, all right, no, I get it. Thanks. The Beast was a was a. I just needed a. I needed a, a creepy monster. You know, I mean, sometimes you just need that. You just need a monster who's just you just need to beat. Who's not sympathetic. Who's not doesn't have a tragic past. Someone this. Is just a greedy, power-hungry, just bad thing that should have never been. The Inferno Mancer was the was the first one. Um, but he got boring for me because he was just a killing machine. There was nothing interesting for me about him. Like when he showed up, people were gonna die, and it was gonna be a bloodbath. And, those are interesting for me for a little while, but like in the long run, it's like, I want to talk to this guy, but there's no talking to him. An author that I, I used to read, uh, her name was Christy Golden, she said, uh, she said to me, um, every character, every hero she liked to write and you really needed to earn their happy ending. I knew that everything was going to be okay for most of the characters. So when they were getting through, put through the grinder, like Dominic getting hurt, um, Dex Garrett getting ripped apart. I feel like I could have only done that if tolerated that kind of punishment 
for my characters and, and, and torture and rigors if I was the guy in charge. If I was the one reading, I'd be like, what the fuck is wrong with this author? He hates his characters. I feel like it gave some realness to these characters. Uh, it, gave, it showed that they were vulnerable despite being so, like, magically outlandish and powerful that they still could be cut and you'd see that cut forever. Character development, I think, was the biggest theme I was consciously going for. Uh, no character remaining the same, seeing characters be very different from where the stories they used to be in to the stories that they are in now. Piggert, the, 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 the name for, the, the slur for orcs. I'm the most proud of and the most ashamed of that bit of slang because it, like, it's nasty and it's so nasty it made me uncomfortable to write it sometimes. Like, because it's got the double G and like, Piggert. God, that's awful. All right. Because a writing teacher once told me there's no tears for the writer, there's no tears for the reader. We make video games and stories that are like the humans versus the orcs. That's not racism, that's fantasy. That's the battle, like the humans versus the orcs, the humans versus the goblins. But if you, like, to make it feel like racism, like the way that we know it, you gotta be heavy-handed with it in fantasy. Anyway, and come up with words, slang words like piggert and make your, the, uh, like, the orcs or the monsters not monsters, but just a race of people. And they met at, um, during the, the curse storyline, where the, the fish curse, there's still, people still laugh at that one. That joke, that story is over ten years old, people still like it. She was a gag character I was just gonna throw away, but then I saw her with Dominic like, on the page, it's like, the, the girl with the tusks and the, the, grug, the grouchy seer. Okay. No, I like, I like this. I wasn't expecting this, but let's see where this goes. And I just let, I just let their relationship sort of evolve itself. No, they, they tell each other like how much they changed each other. Like Dominic was a grouch. He was a grouchy, grumpy, like I hate everyone's seer. And Luna was a was a was a crying mess who who hated herself and and would, tried to commit suicide. Dominic was made a happier person by Luna, and Luna was put on the path to loving herself. To put on the path to like re like recognizing her her self worth. So those two needed each other. Like one of them didn't need the other more. At the end, it was good versus evil. I mean, the king, the Infernal Mancer, the Beast, those guys were doing bad stuff. And a lot of people were going to suffer for it. And a lot of people did. Uh, and the good guys were our heroes, who had to put a stop to this, because this is not this is not a good thing. Thomas Deacon has, has been over for... What is it? Six months. Wow. Thomas Deacon's been over for maybe about six, five and a half, six months now. Um... But I didn't really miss it. And that made an uh, uh, update. I decided it had to end when I felt myself getting a little burned out. Um, I had been with the characters for a long time. I had been in the setting for a long time. And I was dealing with years and years and thousands of comics of continuity I had to maintain. You know, So I made a conscious decision to end it before I got burned out. Before I started to really resent the setting I was stuck in. I've met too many nice people over the years and too many people have had expressed to me how much the comic meant to them for me to just stop one day or like fizzle out. It had to be an ending, you know? Uh, it's what you've been leading up to, you know? I think it was after the march across Maltok. That was a year long, the year long orc story that I told Huge stakes. That story took a lot out of me. It was a story I really, really was meaning to tell in the comic. And I feel like I nailed it. I hit with a couple of maybe stumbling blocks that maybe looking back, I feel like I could have done a little better, but I think every artist does that. Or every writer does that. Um, I feel like, okay, where the hell can the comic go from here? And I think that's when I first started to say to myself, like, maybe I don't have 
that many more stories to tell with this cast of characters. And the interesting part of his story from page one was he's an oracle. He's not an oracle anymore at the end of the comic. He's a librarian, which I'm sure is, a, is its own set of... <clears throat> of adventures, but my friends are librarians. I'm not a librarian. I'm sure they could tell me stories, but I didn't want to tell the story of Dominic Deegan, head librarian. One of the first named appearances I auctioned off was, uh, was won by a guy named uh, Roberto Mancini. Fantastic name. And it worked out because I had an Italian sort of naming scheme for the Samashi in, in, in Dominic Deegan. So I was able to put him with Arcangelo Scarlatti. And it was the end of the war in hell that he showed up, and they share a bottle of El Felo, the elf wine, to drink to Siegfried's death. I, I saw him later on, and I asked him, like, oh, hey, what'd you think of your named appearance? Like, with the, with your, with Scarlatti and the bottle of elven wine, the El Felo, I never heard from you. And he said, you put me, without knowing it, you put me with one of my favorite characters, Scarlatti. And I was like, oh, well, thank you, I'm happy to do that for you. He says, well, I, I, and I got something for you to thank you for it. Like, thank me? Really? And he takes out of his bag a bottle of wine with a, 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 a label on it that says El Felo. And beneath it is written something in, like, Tolkien's Elvish. And it translates to some, like, to some, some toast. I forget what it said, but it was, it was very, very nice. And I love wine, so I was very happy to get free wine. I was like, oh, dude, this is amazing! Thank you! I, I love wine, and this is really cool. Thanks, you put so much work into this. Oh, hey, what, what kind of wine is this? Like, is it a Merlot? Is it a, is it a Cabernet? Or what brand did you use to... You know, I'm curious. And he says to me, uh, It's not a brand. My uncle owns a vineyard. And we made this bottle for you. And there's pictures of me that no one will ever see of me with this guy. I, I'm crying. I'm so touched. Like, my eyes are puffy. I'm like... <laughs> I still have the bottle to this day. It's in the kitchen. I still have it. A couple of years ago, a young lady came up to me and she said a mind-blowing fact to me. She said, I, I grew up reading Dominic Deegan. And Dominic Deegan was about 10 years old at that point. 9, 10 years old at that point. So I did the math. I was like, hey, if you're 21 now, that means you were... You were 12 when you st- Oh my god, that is growing up! As at a convention down in Texas, so a, young a young woman says, Hey, hey um, I've been your fan for a long time, and so was my friend who was a cancer patient. And she was speaking in the past tense, so I knew a sad story was coming up. I'm like, oh no, I'm so sorry. She says, well, I just want you to know... I want you to know that... Uh, well, she's no longer with us, but in her final weeks, your comic was one of the few things that could still make her smile. And that almost knocked me out of my chair. Dominic Deegan ended on the first day of Anime Boston this year. So a lot of people uh, were seeing the last comic, had seen the last comic as they were coming over to my table to see me. Or they had seen it that morning and then were coming over. One of the first uh, people to come up to my table had just come from her table in the dealer's room, the artist alley, from her laptop, having just seen it. And she was this close to crying. She's like, I just saw the last comic. And she held her hands out for a hug. And I came around the table and I hugged her. And then she started crying. And this was serious crying. Like, she had her, like, her hands dug into my arms. She was doing that shivery sob where it's like, <gasps> it was touching. It was really, really touching. And like, I was that, I became that close to crying too because I didn't really have a chance to have it sink in. I was like, I I'd finished the comic and then it was time for Anime Boston. Like, get to work, you know? So to have that be like the first reaction to the end of the comic is this young lady very, very sweet, hugging me, like, intensely and crying big boulder tears, too. Like, not the little, not the little ones. These are the big ones that just fly down your face. That was very touching. And, like, man, I must have, I must have done something right over 11 years. My fans have been so wonderful. Um, I've gotten so much love from them over the years. So much support. So many, just wonderful messages whether it's in emails 
uh, coming to see me at conventions. Like, I really was blessed with some fantastic fans. Something somebody had said to me that got me saying something, which is along the lines of, like, it feels good to have a story that is just complete now. And at that moment, it hit me that the story I'd been working on for 11 years, now it feels like a real story. Overall. Like, I had written stories with these characters, but now all those stories are chapters to me in a larger story, which is now over. It was the greatest experience of my life. Everything that I have going for me, everything that I have to be thankful for, the fact that you're here doing this, the fact that I met my wife because I was doing conventions promoting Dominic Deegan. The fact that one of my best friends was starting that burlesque troupe and it asked me to be a part of it. The people that I've met, the stories that I've told, the gifts that I've received, just the fulfillment of it all. It's been the, the greatest experience of my life and the greatest 11 years ever. And to the day I die, I can hold on to this fact that for 11 years, People were growing, some people were growing up with my work and caring about my characters. Not a lot of people get that. And I'm, I was thankful, I am thankful for every single day that I had with Dominic Deegan. For all of its ups and downs, for all of its trials and sometimes headaches. I'd do it all again exactly the same. A good friend of mine um, had been bothering me for, for years to read Dominic Deegan. She just ranted and raved about how amazing this comic was. Um, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. And then I, I, I saw this madman at um, sitting just across the way at uh, in, in the artist alley at Kineticon in 2005. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's, that's that dude that makes that comic that Kate likes. I should go say hi to him. And I did. I approached him with the idea um for a, a, a space adventure called Captain Space. And uh, he took a look at the script and there was a couple of jokes that kind of sold him. Yeah. He said, I, I, yes, yeah, let's I pursue wanna, this. It was, like, it was like everything that I loved about like classic golden age sci-fi. Someone had, and, had mentioned that, you know, like the villains are all really solid, but like you might have a problem when your main character is really interchangeable. That was around the time that the, the, the DC did their 52 reboot, and there was that <laughs> and like, whole- And like that every whole, female character was suddenly awful. Yeah, every sudden. female character was suddenly like a sex object. We're not seeing the superhero female leads we want to see. So let's and do this And apparently a lot of other people wanted to Yeah, see, so you know? let's just do it ourselves. It said that she has the power of a star. Like she has some sort of a star power. That's kind of a celebrity pun. Star power. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Yeah. Go. Cool. Let's do it. And you didn't like star yeah, power I know, at first. first. I had yeah, to fight you I, yeah, big no, time to, I, for it, that. You know, I mean, at, at first I was like, star power. It's like, really can't be. I mean, it's just like, ah, it's just like, I mean, because the only thing I could think of for the longest time was like, you know, like '80s hair band kind of like star power, yeah, like kind of nonsense. Yeah, you know. And I was like, I don't know that I want to do a comic with that association <laughs> to it. <laughs> you know, and it's funny you know, it's, too, like the way you you drew her on the on the, oh, banner, yeah, on the I know, cover of the first I know. issue like this. When I premiered, when I started showing that banner at Anime Boston, mm -hmm. like the day after Dominic Deegan, the day that Dominic Deegan officially ended, mm -hmm. people were walking by, looking at it, going just. Star power! <laughs> yeah, I no, was like, I, we are on to something. Eventually, here. I came around to it because I, I mean, by the time I was drawing <laughs> that cover, I was like, yeah, we're gonna throw a little bit of that into yeah, we it, gotta, right? Yeah. You know, we wanted her reactions to be more <sighs> to everything, as opposed to like, what does it mean to be a hero? <laughs> Dying next to that. Uh, I'm so tired I, of angsty heroes. I don't know what it means to do good. No one can get close to me. It's too dangerous. <laughs> no one can love me. It's too much of a but fuck. That. <laughs> we got settled on star power, right? But we didn't really know what her name was going to be for a bit, and so I did what I always do when I'm coming up with character names. Is I go to my favorite like name meaning database, um, and I, I did a search for you know names with star in like the definition. So Danica means, if I'm remembering this correctly, um, uh, the 
means day star, which is a, a term for Venus, and Maris means of the sea. But very, there's a, there's a very there's a fairly famous art piece um, that is lit, uh, entitled Stella Maris, Star of the Sea. When we first sat down on the project, we like we hammered out a lot of the big points. Is that like, you know, if if we were going to be doing this kind of comic, I wanted to make sure that. You know, this, this, and this were a thing in it. And you were like, those are all the things I wanted to <laughs> see exactly. in a comic. <laughs> I've, been kind of, I've been kind of impressed by how little we wind up disagreeing on things. I mean, we, do, we definitely do disagree on uh, various points. Um, although our disagreements tend to be more like, more of the, I'm not sure about this one. What do you think? And, you know, usually that's enough for, for us to go... You know, now that you say something, yeah. I'm not sure I like it either. Because we were so used to, with you know, with Dominic Deegan and with Comedity and Finders Keepers, we were the only ones working on these things. So we were our own filters. The first draft of issue three, you told me to just scrap the whole thing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad I, you I did. felt really bad about it. No, but that. I'm glad you did, man, because it was terrible. 12 pages, or 12 or 13 pages yeah. were just like, what do you think, Garth? And you came back just and like, dude, I'm not, no, not feeling I'm it. not drawing this. Yeah. I love drawing the Countess and the other Centillions because they have these like great big sweeping forms and they're all like these graceful curves. But they're we I, I don't know why I did this to myself, but they're wearing these incredibly, incredibly elaborate semi-Elizabethan, you know, outfits <laughs> with these great big frill collars and like jewelry everywhere. And I'm like, Damn me <laughs> in the details. <laughs> Shilalis was one of the fun designs because, like, I, you know, I was like, I, I, I knew I wanted a girl alien, but I didn't want. I don't like. I don't really like doing the like aliens with boobs because, like, <laughs> it's like I feel like that should be a mostly like human thing. Like, I mean, some of the other alien, you know, aliens do have them, right? Like, the, but it's only a couple of them so right. far, and I want to keep it kind of like. There's only a couple of races where like boobs are common, you know. Uh, and and but I want but I knew that I wanted to like create this alien that was clearly feminine, you know, would read as female without it being like and here are her tits. And, right. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was like, um, what if it's just what if we take a tentacled horror basically is what yeah this <laughs> is just all tentacles and. Like made it into like a body that was like yeah that looks like a chick yeah. somehow. Sure, I did a, a convention at uh, Smith College in, in in Massachusetts, which is an all women's college, and uh, some uh, someone at the convention she comes right she hadn't seen Star Power before, but she'd seen um, the banner that has uh, that displays Star Power in her full costume, and she just looks at the banner and looks at the cover and just points to me and just goes, thank you. At Intervention, which is a convention in the in the, the DC area, mm -hmm. he was uh, he was um, looking for comics to show his little girl, uh, who must have been like what five or oh, so. Oh, she was pretty young. Like four yeah. or five. Yeah. Like he wants he wants to like I want to share comics with my little girl, and someone had pointed him over to us, said like check these guys out, and he thumbed through the first two issues of Star Power, and he looks at us and he says, "This looks like something I can show my little girl. I'll take two. Ad infinitum, if that's the right way to say that. Just as long as we want to go. It's it's Latin. I don't going know. To care. Yeah, <laughs> someone's gonna be like, dear Mookie, you fucker, <laughs> butchering the beauty of the Latin language. It's a the dead language, Romans, guys. The Get over Romans, it. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And that's why no one will ever love you. <laughs> that's what I've always strived for with 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 making comics. Is like, do people will people care about what happens next? Like, do they, will they care about these characters enough to come back? And that was always what I went for. I wasn't always going for a laugh. I wasn't always going for the dramatic cliffhanger. I just wanted people to come back the next day to know that they cared. 